And if you're joining us here in Prague in the room, if you wouldn't mind signing into the blue sheets which are circulating. Thanks for coming on a Friday morning at nine o'clock. <laughs> um, for those of you online and also in the room, you'll see the note well. Um, please take a look at that online. It's also indicated on the blue sheets that this is part of the of what we um, what we do here at the IETF. We make sure that people are aware of um, what the policies are. Sorry, Jane, could you hear me? Yes, we can. I send you uh, some final corrections of my presentation. It's uploaded. It should be. I, I uploaded it this morning. Yes, but I just send it uh, another one. Uh, do you have time to, to change it? It will be fine. But... I'm going to hear alone, so no. <laughs> but I'll upload it after, if you don't mind. OK. OK, thanks. Jane? Yes? This is Julian. Hi, Julian, I did see your slides. I'm going to try and upload them. Okay. Uh, sure. Go ahead. Um, I, I send a presentation and PDF. Uh, I have it. And I'll try and upload it now. Give me one second. Okay. Thank you. So for those of you in the room, give me about two minutes.
And thank you for joining. We're going to start in about a minute. I'm just uploading some more slides. And we're going to start with Michuki Mwangi. Uh, Michuki is from Kenya and works for the Internet Society. He'll do a, an introduction about peering and interconnection in sub-Saharan Africa, where he's done more to help provide connectivity than just about anybody I know. Um, so give it one minute as I upload the other slides. Okay, if you're in the room, you're at Gaia, <laughs> Global Access to the Internet for All. Our charter is online, you can take a look. Otherwise, a lot of what we do here is um, bring in presentations from people who are either building connectivity, new innovative tech solutions around the world. We've been focused mostly on community networks over the last um, three or four meetings, but we're bringing in more and more on, um, we're going to be bringing in more and more on internet exchange points, routing, data collection. So today, the first person up is Michuki, and I see him on, I did see him on Meet Echo. Um, Michuki, you're up first, and I'm going to show your slides here in the room, and hopefully we can see you in a minute. So over to you, Michuki. Uh, thank you, Jen. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be here at Gaia today and present. Um, the title of my presentation here uh, this morning is developing peering and interconnection through partnerships in Africa and basically just shows an overview of what we've been able to do in Africa uh, while I've been at the Internet Society for the last 10 years um, working in, um, in internet development and also uh, promoting interconnection and traffic exchange and um, part of the success that we've seen in the past 10 years is largely due to um, the support we've had from partners uh, through partnerships and collaboration. So um, I'll start off with a bit of a background in terms of where all this started. Um, I joined the Internet Society in 2008 and um, I was at the time also working with the Kenya Internet Exchange Point. Uh, so next slide, Jane. Um, and during that time, we wanted to get involved. Uh, there was an interest from the Internet Society to work on Internet exchange points, but there wasn't a clear understanding of what was really happening in the region. So the first thing we did um, is uh, did a survey of the exchange points that were in place and tried to understand what was really going on. So at the time, there were about 17 IXPs in 15 African countries and we tried to send a survey to each one of them and get some feedback. And about 12 were actually responsive um, after a lot of nagging and probing. Uh, but we did get some data, like you know when they were established, um, how much traffic they had, um, how they were um, operating in terms of their governance, uh, what kind of uh, pairing policy they had and so on. And this uh, survey that we did in 2008 has actually been used as a benchmark um, to start off to, or to rather build on to the work that we've done over the years. And FIX has been maintaining uh, the surveys uh, to date, the most recent being in 2017. And we'll have a look at that data um, uh, later on in my presentation. Um, we also see, uh, if you're seeing the presentation on the diagram, that at that time in, there were only two submarine cables in Africa, um, mostly on the West African side of the continent and the CMU3, uh, which goes on to Asia. So next slide, Jim. Um, so one of the things which was interesting to, to identify at that point in time was that 
Um, based on the responses we received, there were just about uh, there was just about 300 Mbps uh, or megabits per second being exchanged through the IXPs in Africa, which was quite small. And so, and a, a couple of the other uh, gaps we identified. If you could go, oh sorry, and before I move on, um, and majority of this traffic was actually in South Africa, with all the other exchange points in the continent being relatively small. Um, next slide, please, Jane. Um, so the gaps we identified from this survey was that there was a lack of general knowledge on IXP best practices. Um, you know, uh, IXPs didn't know where to go in terms of sharing experiences on how to grow and develop. So they were pretty much operating in, uh, in a silo. Um, there was almost no interconnection between cross borders um, of, of various countries. So uh, packets between one country to the other in Africa all had to go through Europe. Um, we didn't understand why some of the IXPs weren't responsive. Um, and if, as you saw in the uh, initial map that I showed, West Africa was pretty much uh, lagging behind with respect to IXPs. And essentially, if you look at the data with only 300 megabits per second compared to how much Africa was importing at the time, uh, there was what we term then as an internet transit deficit, uh, which in comparison to other regions was quite huge. So um, the next slide. Um, so we, we opted to start the work and to start the work, um, we wanted to identify how do we actually uh, uh, scope out what we need to do and have an impact. And the first thing we went ahead to do, uh, next slide, is to um, map out the partners or whom we need to work out with, uh, to, to partner with and collaborate with to be able to create an impact. And so we did an exercise where we mapped out what we call the spheres of influence and identified the policy makers, the operators and service providers, the IXPs and the technical community as part of the ecosystem that we needed to engage with um, in developing peering and interconnection in Africa. Next slide, please. And um, in so doing, um, we were able now to start mapping out how we'll work with those partners to uh, do work when it came to issues of like uh, technical and best practice workshops for countries that either didn't have IXPs or had IXPs but didn't have the training. Uh, where there were new IXPs expected and help them set up, uh, be it equipment, be it uh, actual setup. Um, uh, we did provide technical assistance as well, um, and also held IXP meetings. And uh, two years later into the work around 2010, we launched the African Peering and Interconnection Forum, where we were bringing together the operators, the service providers, um, uh, the uh, policy makers, um, IXPs to talk about peering and uh, you know like at that particular meeting we'll start the event with what we call um, um, the, the peering game which basically help people have a better understanding of what um, the peering and interconnection was all about. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, we, we had uh, during this period between um, 2008 and 2019 we were able to cover quite a lot of ground. Uh, we've been able to organize nine AFPIF events. So this year will be the 10 year anniversary. And over this period, we've had, of, we've had over 50 organizations supporting the AFPIF events. Uh, we've done workshops in 22 countries. And this is excluding the work we did with the African Union on Axis, which I'll talk about sh shortly after. Uh, trained over 500 engineers. Um, supported the setup of the AFIX Association, uh, or the, uh, um, which is the African IXP Association. Um, we've partnered with organizations like Cisco, Google, and Facebook to provide equipment uh, to and technical assistance to I, more than 20 IXPs. We've engaged policymakers to make sure that uh, the issues of IXPs are brought to their attention of policymakers um, and support their setup and creation. We've done studies that have been used to reinforce our messaging on the importance and value and benefit of IXPs and worked with 
uh, organizations like Testbook, the IXPN in Nigeria, uh, Rwanda, and Akamai, among others. And of course, um, one of the things which we've also been able to do is develop a tool that enables us to keep measuring um, what we are doing and see whether there's actually any impact or uh, growth over the same period. And basically, as a result, the ecosystem has evolved. We are seeing new data centers coming up there in the region. There's been policy review in favor of IXPs and so on. And as a result of the work that we did, if you look at the next slide, uh, you will see that um, we were able to implement uh, or we were able to bid, successfully bid and implement the African Union project uh, called AXIS. And uh, that helped us do a total of about 63 workshops within a period of two years. Um, basically uh, created a new partnership between the African Union and the Internet Society and the technical community. Um, we covered 28 countries in the continent with the workshops, uh, went to most of them twice. Um, as a result, there have been 10 new IXPs, more than, uh, at least 10 new IXPs that have been set up. Um, support of eight IXPs to grow into regional IXPs. And of course, um, an increased awareness. Um, if you come to Africa, not just policymakers, but um, decision makers are well aware about IXPs and the value that they bring. So, um, and also an, another important issue here is also the issue of cross-border. And we've, we've seen that that has also had an impact. So um, if you look at the next slide, um, I did mention about AFPIF. And uh, one of the things I wanted to mention about the success of AFPIF is that our ability to partner and collaborate has actually yielded more than 50 organizations supporting the event. If you look at this low, uh, this banner, rather, this is just after if last year we had more than 30 sponsors coming to the event and supporting organizations and so on. So, um, and this is just one year and we've been on for the last night. So it's, it's a great success in, in my view and uh, basically a, a clear indicator that to have an impact, collaboration and partnership is, is key. So what are the outcomes? And uh, very quickly before I run out of time. Um, so the first outcome was that there was an accepted vision for Africa where 80% of the traffic is, there is a vision to reverse that internet transit deficit where 80% um, of the traffic is expected to be locally accessible and only 20% international uh, by the year 2020. Now, this may sound ambitious, has sounded ambitious, but you know, a couple of years ago, we had networks saying that they have reached 70, 30, and they will get there before the year 2020. Uh, if you look at the next slide, you will see also we've had um, more than 44 IXPs. So this is a huge growth, um, over 100% growth since 2008. Uh, traffic has grown significantly, more than 400 gig of traffic is being exchanged. And West Africa doesn't look like, it, sorry. Um, I had a timer. And so um, there's been a lot of IXPs emerging in the West and North part of the continent. So I'll just quickly go through the next set of slides because uh, I think I have about two, two minutes left. So uh, the growth in the continent has been significant um, in terms of the traffic, as you can see. So this is data that FIX maintains uh, with respect to using the baseline that we did in 2008. Uh, the next slide, you will see that we've had traffic growing very fast uh, over 400 gig now. Um, next slide, you'll see that the number of networks has also increased from uh, slightly under uh, 200, and, or rather 150 to more than 866 networks connected. And the tool that we developed for measurements uh, called ARDA actually helps us see how networks are connected both at the national level. Um, you are able to see what percentage of the networks uh, of ASNs uh, in a particular country are connecting to a particular IX. Next slide, please. Um, so looking at Benin, 
And then next slide, you will also be able to see what happens uh, between cross border. And this is an example of Tanzania where you can see there's uh, a huge number of Afrinic external to Tanzania, Afrinic ASNs or external to Tanzania that are connected or visible at the exchange point in Tanzania. So next slide, please. Um, and in the next one as well. So um, despite all of this, there's been a couple of challenges as, um, and I think uh, a lot of the challenges are quite uh, what we've, uh, we found with a couple of slight improvements. There are issues with terrestrial infrastructure, carrier neutral data centers are not there. The cross border is still not to the level where we'd like it to be. Next slide. Um, and of course, the issue of managing stakeholder uh, interest, uh, because when governments do get involved, it does tend out to have some, so create some problems. However, the work still continues. And um, basically, um, IXPs are operational, but they do face some uh, challenges with respect to, uh, you know, not having sustainable business uh, models. Uh, where they have volunteer staff and being able to keep up with everything that's happening um, versus paid staff and also issues of good governance um, and meeting their obligations. Next slide, please. So um, the work continues. Uh, next. Um, next. Yes, so the work continues. And uh, basically, uh, some of the work that we're going tends to address some of the challenges. And basically, we would like to make sure that uh, we support IXPs with the equipment, uh, capacity building, um, new ones are supported, um, support the work that FIX is doing in bringing together the stakeholders, work on measurements to make sure that there is increasing uh, data available to see what the, where the gaps are and where need, more efforts need to be put in place. And also continuing to push on policy issues to address some of the pending issues on cross-border interconnection and terrestrial capacity availability um, across the continent. So one of the things that we are working on, on the next slide, is we have an ongoing, we have a new partnership that started last year with Facebook and uh, basically spans over two years and it's going to, uh, cover or span across uh, training and community mobilization, doing uh, best practice workshops and technical aspects training. IXP infrastructure development, so we'll give equipment, switches, optical transceivers, and others for existing IXPs to upgrade and new ones that are coming up. And also help with the peering ecosystem development and the community of practice, which are the peering roadshows and AFPIF and so on. And then finally, one of the things which has been happening is the deployment of caches at IXPs, uh, we've seen has been um, a challenge and we have a, a, a process in place to help a couple of IXPs over the next three years to sort of help them implement uh, caches at the exchange point that can be shared with all the stakeholders. So that sort of shows that the partnership is continuing. Uh, we've had re a relatively good success and we continue to identify with partners and organizations that have an interest in developing the, uh, the IXP and peer in peering and interconnection ecosystem in Africa to, to improve that space. So I'd like to stop there and thank you very much Happy to take any questions. Sorry, Does Jane, I ran slightly over time. <laughs> thank you, Michuki. Um, does anyone have any questions for Michuki in the room or online? Okay, I see no one in the room. Um, Michuki, thank you very much. The slides are uploaded into the Gaia deck. And yep, there's some very interesting comments. Thank you very much, Michuki, for from the, some of the people in the Jabber chat. Um, and for those of you that um, had heard Michuki talk about the African Peering and Interconnection Forum that happens in August, uh, August 20th through 22nd, it's really been an amazing event to watch um, the number of networks coming in, the content delivery and um, general operators, but people, everything from submarine cable operators to terrestrial fiber um, providers attend those meetings to talk about building the African internet. 
So thank you very much, Michuki. Um, if anyone has any other questions, Michuki's reachable. I think his email is in the presentation. And thank you very much. So the next person up is Miriam Kune from RIPE, a sister organization of, um, of many of ours. <laughs> and she's going to talk about RIPE tools. Thank you, Jane. Um, do you want me to click? <laughs> That's um, that was amazing progress. I remember the early days, and um, Michuki and all his colleagues have done an, a tremendous job there. Um, now to something completely different. <laughs> um, some of you might be familiar with this. I'm just going to do a, it's a bit of a mixed bag of certain tools and data sets that might be relevant and that, that, that are all available and publicly accessible. So it might be um, interesting for researchers, but also operators. And some of them also help to measure this kind of progress um, that, that Mitsuki has um, shown. Um, well, I'm not going to talk about what the RIRs do. I think most of you will know this. Um, the yellow bit there is our service region, so it's quite large, and there are five of us um, worldwide, and we all do slightly different um, activities. And so the RIPE NCC has originally started out as a community secretariat, so as a secretariat for the RIPE community, and maybe that's also why um, we're doing a, a bit more maybe than the other RIRs um, um, as in community work and, and um, developing tools and, and measurements and, and, and data and statistics um, and I'm um, doing a lot of community building as well. Um, so to dive right into Web Atlas, I think also maybe most of you have, are familiar with this. How many of you have a Web Atlas probe at home? All right, yes. Good. I don't didn't bring any, but I have, we have a new version. I'll um, I'll talk about it in a second. So it basically is a distributed measurement network that does active measurements um, um, of um, network, um, not traffic, but um, delays basically. So I'll I'll, I'll get to that. So we have over ten thousand of them um, available. We just came out with a new version, version four. It's this one. Um, it's um, about, it's yeah, a bit more stable than the old one, has more memory and it's just kind of a little bit better. Um, we also have these called Web Atlas Anchors. They're just kind of mega probes. They have more memory and can do more measurements and they can also use as targets for other probes. Um, and we're covering over 180 countries at the moment with those probes. You saw the map early on. And, um, and we're still working on expanding the reach like of the topology. So you can see we um, are currently um, covering 3,600 IPv4 ASs and uh, about 1,500 IPv6 ASs. So there's still some work to do because there are a lot more out there. Um, and so we're now starting to um, actively distribute these new um, probes. And as I said, all the data is publicly available. And I believe I have a link here on this slide at the bottom. You can find statistics. You can find APIs. Um, and, um, and graphics and everything. And so it does what these little devices do. Basically, you plug them in your router at home or in your network somewhere, and they do active measurements, and then they're listed there, like ping, trace, route, DNS, SSL, NTP, and to a certain extent, HTTP. And I could do a whole different presentation about the whole ethical background of these measure measurements, um, which are actually really interesting, but I'm not going to do that now. Um, um, because HTTP measurements was a huge discussion, and now some people wanted us to enable them, but there is also a certain risk associated with that if you because you can use other people's probes to initiate measurements and HTTP measurements in some countries or certain websites in some countries just aren't, you know, are illegal. And so we only enabled HTTP measurements towards these mega probes, these anchors. And so the, the hosts of these anchors, they are aware of this and they, they um, accept that. Um, yeah, there are APIs, there are visualizations, there are also some command line tools and um, you can stream real life data. There's a lot of data um, out there at the moment. Also, you can run your own measurements, but it's always worth looking if somebody else has already um, done a similar measurement that you can just um, reuse. Um, and a new thing I wanted to mention here, so there's a whole lot of people have come up with the greatest use cases that we have never foreseen um, for Web Atlas. And there's a lot of use cases and statistics and graphics uh, published already on, um, on the Web Labs um, blog that we're running. This is a relatively new thing I wanted to show you because um, it's, um, 
it shows kind of nice um, overview of countries infrastructure um so we kind of got back gone back to um end-to-end -end measurements so a lot of there's a lot of um client to server measurements out there because it's um there were people do to improve traffic um, um, and, um, and, and cost um, optimization. And so we looked at peer-to-peer -peer and serverless connections and, um, and, and, and came up with this. There's a link here, you can go there. They, I think the slides, I think the link on the slides are all interactive, you can click on them. And, um, and then you get something like, well, I'll get to that. Um, the base, um, the, this, this tool is based on Web Atlas, but also in the, on APNIX data, um, their, their um, population data that they publish. And it's based on Web Atlas and another tool that kind of measures the IXPs, um, traffic that goes through IXPs. Um, that's also an interesting tool, it's linked there. And all that together, we come up with something like this. Um, so this is just an example, this is Belgium, and you probably can't read the, um, all the descriptions there, but what you basically see is the main um, service providers in that country or the main network in that country. and um, only those networks that have more than 1% user base in that particular country. And so we only look at, um, when I say country, there's like Atlas probes in, in that country, right? And, and the population data that APNIC provides. And so the larger the ring is that you can see, the larger the, the segment of the ring, the larger the network. And then you have these little dots in there in, in the ring, that's the end users. And so we basically measure one Atlas probe to another Atlas probe and then the path. That, that these, these trace routes kind of do. And so you can see in the middle, for instance here, is, um, is it an orange um, like ring that's an exchange point. So you can see some traffic goes through an exchange point. The blue rings are um, transit providers and, um, and there are also some direct, not in this case, I think some direct links. And then if you go to the website, it's interactive. You can go onto the link and it gives you some more, uh, you can go onto these graphs and it gives you some more information about each of the networks. And I'm just going to flip through some countries because you can see quite nicely the, the kind of the network ecosystem in, in a country. And you can also, if you go on the website, you can see um, change the timeline so you can go back in time. And it's amazing how this changes. It's not very stable actually, you know. So from month to month, you see traffic going through exchange points and then, it, then the exchange point disappears, it comes back. So it's quite interesting. Um, this is the U.S., for instance. You see a lot of little networks there. Um, so I said only the networks that have uh, more than 1% users. So the gap there is all the other networks that we didn't even take into account. So there are a lot more networks in there. So that's a very m meshed kind of um, network in the U.S. A lot of um, transit providers, a lot of exchange points. So that's um, kind of one extreme, if you will. Um, there are others that are much more clean, like the Germans. Um, so this one is one has a lot, like German, uh, Dutch Telecom is a big one. And there are like three or so exchange points that a lot of traffic goes through. And um, there, it's, it's a quite a stable um, um, network there. Um, this is Slovakia, I thought we're close by, so I'll show that. Um, most of the traffic there goes through exchange points. So you see, though you don't see any transit providers, so it's all exchange point um, and based or direct through network, like one network to another. So that's another interesting um, example. Right, so you can go to the website and play with that, look at your country, see how the situation is at the moment. Um, it's still a prototype, so there are a lot of caveats, but if you see anything that looks weird, please um, contact us and we'll, we'll, we'll investigate. Another relatively new thing we did is geolocation for infrastructure. It's also based on Web Atlas. And so, um, and we're crowdsourcing that. So we're using some of the Web Atlas data, but also other data sources that we, um, yeah, we kind of put together in one tool. And then we make, we, we calculate the average and, and, and publish that. And there's a, a labs article um, about that, how we actually do that. And it kind of looks like this. So you can fill in this the interface if you go to the website and fill in a, um, in this case, I put an M6 um, just to show, you know, and it, it measures, it, it finds it, the, the location and then it, it measures trace routes. For instance, you can see visualization there, how traffic goes from one thing to the other. And just the one is stressed that this is infrastructure. So it's like servers um, that basically that we find in the, in the trace routes. It's not end user um, geolocation. 
Another set of tools that we provide, or another tool that's probably familiar to most of you, I think Michuki mentioned route views, and this is another one, and the routing information service that the route NCC has been um, running for, I don't know, 20 years or so. Um, it basically is a network of um, BGP route collectors like worldwide, and it collects a lot of data, so it has over 18 years or maybe 20 years of routing history by, by now. It's used a lot by um, researchers and operators and um, has a number of peers. So there's a map, I think, where all the rat collectors are at the moment. And um, it has um, a lot of different access um, possibilities. You can get the raw data. Um, you can also um, use BGP dump. And um, there is a, and, and you can get through it on to Webstat. Webstat is a tool. I didn't put a link in there. I think I have a, sl a slide on that later on. Um, RAPSTAT is kind of a graphical interface where you can also access all the data sets that I'm presenting here. And this is a new thing we started and we, we announced a few weeks ago. It's a live um, stream on risk, based on risk data and that's been um, received very well in the community because that makes it much easier to monitor um, changes in, in, in a routing system. And it's just an, a screenshot of an example there. It's all just explained in that in that Web Labs article. And finally, all this is in, in the Web Stat um, interface that I just mentioned. It looks like this. This is a graphical interface. You can put in uh, an IP address or an AS number or a domain name or a country code also. And then it kind of spits out a bunch of measurements that we have based on that resource. And so it has a, a default view where you can see um, is it is the AS number, for instance, in this case, is it announced? Where is it located? And then you can dive into the um, the little um, menu bar menus on the left hand side. You can see a lot about the um, the routing or geolocation or um, DNS. We also have some information about um, abuse and blacklists. Um, and then you can get also the raw data for each of those widgets. Um, we, we have um, the raw data available. So these are the data sets that are currently available through Webstat. As I said, all the main data sets that we collect ourselves, obviously the IP registry data from us and the other RERs, um, also Vibris is in there, Web Atlas data, and a bunch of external data sets, and they're, they're listed here. So it, it gives quite an interesting overview of a certain, um, of a specific resource that you um, can look up there. Um, yeah, there are over 50 widgets at the moment, and you can embed them on your own website to use them for monitoring or alerts. And um, there is a lot of documentation and an API and raw data, everything there. Yeah, I'm not going to go through all the use cases. There's just some examples here. Um, and I think that's it. That's the last slide with a bunch of references. You can look them up. Um, some of them are kind of in prototype, like the um, IXP, Country Jedi, and the um, user-to-user -user measurements I, I mentioned earlier. Um, you can you can play with the interface there and let us know what you think. I think that's it. I had one more slide. I didn't put that in. No, I just wanted to mention that a lot of this, and you, you heard me say this, um, is documented on labs.vibe.net, the Vibe Labs um, blog that we, that we maintain. And there is a lot of information, a lot of use cases, and we're also always open. If you, if you find a new use case or if you're working on something interesting, an interesting research project, we are happy to publish that there. That's it. And I'll be back on time. I was you quick. are way on time. <laughs> I'm Thank sorry. you. <laughs> are there any questions? <laughs> any questions for Miriam? Yes. Good. Hi, this is. Luis Contreras from Telefonica. Uh, due to the most of the traffic nowadays is, ba is basically video in the networks, maybe uh, around 60, 70 percent of the, uh, the traffic is video. Have you considering, uh, have you considered to implement a kind of test for, for measuring this? Um, uh, maybe for, for uh, well, accepted the video on YouTube or something like that? You said HTTP traffic. Yes. Yeah, um I, I'm not sure if you have a specific visualization on that because, as I said earlier, we only allow HTTP measurements towards these anchors, and we have about 400 of them in the network, so it's not that many. But um, 
I'm not aware that we actually look specifically at that, but it's a good point. We could um, we, we could do that. I know that um, um, like Wikimedia and other and also other content providers have used Stripe Atlas to um, look at the the placement of their of their CDNs basically. So that's one thing, but that's more like content. But it has of course HTTP in there, but we, I don't know if we have specifically looked at that. But it's a good suggestion. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Runa Barik from University of Oslo. So how do you handle the set of IPs those uh, from the Tresro data? Those are not resolved by IP to ASN or by root view or by looking to the Bogons uh, and they are not owned by any ISP. How do you handle those rest of the IPs which are publicly uh, reachable? So are you asking about the web atlas measurements specifically? No, the set of IPs that you could see in the trace route. Yeah, maybe it, you might see in the, the trace route from Ripe Atlas. Yeah, yeah, in the trace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we basically look at the trace route in the in the um, from one atlas probe to another, and um, that, that's all we measure basically. So in between the trace route, the routers addresses. How do you resolve them? Because I don't find any ISP that um, they own those IPs. I'm not sure we analyze that. Okay. Because you presented the AS diagram, and then because these are the ASS, those whose IPs are resolved to those ASS, but the rest of the IPs I'm asking. Well, they're all announced, so we look at the trace route. Um, well, I, let, let's take that offline. I'm not okay. sure exactly I know okay. what you mean. Okay. Thank Thanks. you for your question. Yeah, that was a good one. And um, yeah, yeah, if you can speak, have, uh, speak right into the microphone because it's okay. hard to hear sometimes. Okay, okay. can you hear me now? Yes, okay. I know it. Yeah, uh, I have uh, one question and one comment. Uh, uh, my question is, what is the coverage of uh, the Atlas props? Do you have now, I remember in the old days, uh, you are pushing for, uh, to put more and more. Uh, so if, uh, do you need still some help so, so that we promote them in the regions uh, and, and how? My second uh, information I have to say, is you were talking about uh, you know use cases that you didn't think about and there is one funny one uh, it's about me uh, my connection that is always well is often off mm -hmm. so uh, before going home to make sure if i have for example a meeting and i'm somewhere else i check on the probe if it is on or off before going home otherwise i will go and do the connection somewhere else so this is an advantage that's great to hear. That's great. Home. That's a that's a really that's a very legitimate use case. I know people also use it basically to double to, to check if the power is still on in their house when they're on travel and they have like a vacation home somewhere remote, um, because it'll give you a warning if the probe is off. Apparently, may, maybe the power is off as well, right? But then um, to your first question, yes, we still we definitely need um, better coverage, specifically outside Europe. So we are still very much interested in you helping out with um, distributing the probes. And I know ISOC is helping a lot, distributing them, Afrinic and other RIRs. Um, we had a bit of a gap now because we just um, came out with these new probes, but we are you know, back on the game now. So we are definitely interested in, 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 in covering and in, in distributing more probes. So thanks for your help. I know you are helping out a lot. Hi, Miriam Brooks, go forward from Jant. Um, what's, what was the name of that service that does the, the magic circle diagrams? I'm not sure it has a real name okay. yet. It's just I, I, the one, right? I, I found it, but I, I really like it. Oh, thank um, you. And so obviously the gray, uh, obviously anyone who pops up gray there, they have ah, zero probes yes, in their AS. Yes, good point. So that's a good way of... That's a good point because I looked through some of the countries and I didn't use them as an example because there are a lot of gray areas in there where you don't have any probes. And then that's a good indication of countries that actually need more probes for us to do proper measurements. Yeah, good point. Especially for the large uh, ISPs. Exactly. Right? Um, we should do something for the R&E networks that looks like this to see how they're interconnected. And that might be uh, useful for looking at R&E networks in Africa and whether yeah. they're using IXPs yeah. or whether they have to transit everything back to Europe to uh, to get connectivity. Yeah, happy to collaborate there, Brooke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I know how to get in contact with you. And, yeah. Great, thanks. That's a good suggestion. I don't see anything in the Jabber chat other than thank you. <laughs> um, 
Any other yeah. questions for Miriam? You know how to reach her, and the, the yes. Curb Project is amazing, um, and huge supporters of it, and we love the new graphics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I had some contact points on the last slide, but you've probably oh, seen them, perfect. so, okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, the next person up is Shavi, and Shavi, we're gonna pull your slides up. Um, if you wanna introduce yourself, um, we will pull the slides up and let you have at it. Hi, could you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Xavi Poza from Barcelona. Uh, we work in a small ISP based on, on fiber and, and wireless networks. We deliver services to the end users and also for administration, also for public uh, companies. And we are based on Giphy.net uh, foundation, so all of our network that we are building is based on common networks and can be used by other operators that join uh, Giphy.net foundation. So today uh, we want to talk about the fiber optic uh, external plan or the best practices for, for start a project of own uh, fiber. Uh, um, we can see uh, all the all the steps uh, about uh, the process uh, in between. So, first of all, we need to plan uh, the global feasibility of the project. Uh, this is a huge work because uh, we need to think about all the aspects uh, related. Uh, then we will. Uh, have the next step about technical feasibilities. Uh, the cable could be tired. We need to see uh, also some legal aspects in the in the countries. The different countries, the, the legal is different. We need to produce a network design just to to have a good uh, planification. Then we have the cable tie. Uh, it's a dirty job, <laughs> as I always see. Uh, also, which electronics we will deploy in the in the network, <clears throat> and considerations about the final uh, or the, the consequent maintenance that the network have to 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 be. So, uh, next. Uh, we can see the feasibility of the project, which uh, with techniques we need to have uh, in present. And the first is the capex available. And for calculate the capex, one of the most important thing is if we have civil work needed to deploy the fiber. So this is uh, the most expensive part of the project. Uh, and if we can plan before that, uh, it will help us to have a very close number to the final. Uh, price of the of the deployment. Also, we need to have to plan is uh, the transport availability. We will do via radio or via fiber optic. Uh, it depends on the remotely zone if it's connected or not. So we can plan also uh, wireless uh, links to to have a transport link uh, to the to the main point of present. Uh, we need to talk about uh, the OPEX, the maintenance cost, uh, because we will have then to maintenance this network. It's not only need to start, we need to calculate the transport services. What's the cost of that? Uh, the maintenance that will, it will have. It will constitute like an operator or an associator. Uh, it, it, it then will, will have uh, administrative uh, aspects to be considered and also if we will have uh, expenses about the infrastructure uh, if we are renting towers or renting some conducts to, to other operators then we need to consider also technical uh, feasibility means that we need to plan uh, work for from where past the cable uh, as you can see in the picture uh, this is uh, from Barcelona. Uh, you can see four operators that have deployed the fiber in the front of the building. 
Also, you can see the, the box of the copper cables. Uh, also, you can observe that the fiber optics are not uh, empty, uh, are not full, sorry. So, uh, we need to plan also the capacity of the network before, because if not, we are getting into into extra cost that maybe uh, we don't want to have in, at the beginning. Uh, uh, we need to consider here if the owner uh, wants to to have the cable in the uh, or it under the window. <laughs> so keep the keep the the aspect in a in a good way. Let's see the next uh, about the conduits. Uh, the, through the way of past the fiber, we will have an open space because sometimes all the conduits are full and it will complicate a lot the, the fiber, the complete project only for one one part of the of the way. So uh, that's uh, very very important to have a very uh, nice uh, vision of the of all the way where we will pass the cable. Also, <clears throat> the poles. The poles are normally owned uh, in Spain by Telefonica, so we need to talk uh, with, with them and have a pre-planification because sometimes the poles are very old uh, or maybe if we add some, some cables to the pole, uh, the, the tension that it, that it has uh, needs to, to, to change the pole by another one bigger or, or made by another material. So it's very, very important thing to be considered also. Uh, for planning this, those things, uh, we have access to the Movistar database uh, where uh, we can see the canalization, the current conduct, uh, and, and have an idea if we are talking about X meters of uh, uh, conducted uh, cables or if we need to pass some poles or walls uh, and follow the path that normally uh, is, is designed by, by Movistar. This is not mandatory, but it's very, very recommended to have that plan in the, in the middle. Also, uh, for rent this kind of uh, conduit that owns the, uh, the operator, uh, here in Spain we have to talk uh, with Movistar and the CMC uh, forces Movistar to to rent his uh, his conducts. So we need to talk about uh, with them, uh, plan a, a consequent uh, planification of, of the of the tie, and and of course, if we need to have change, then to plan again the the, the problem. But. For now, it's it's available in, in Spain uh, through the website. So that's the replanning that we need to do. Uh, you can see in the picture a replacement of one pole that we need to change it, but another bigger and, and stronger. Uh, and also maybe the conduct uh, inside this uh, this second uh, picture, uh, if the if this is full, then we need to construct uh, another one, or maybe we need to. Uh, try another way. Uh, there are other uh, systems that we have used in the past, uh, maybe passing uh, the cable through the conduits of water. Uh, this is a very new uh, implementation. Uh, it's not cheap, but it has a very good results because we can pass the fiber between, uh, put a conduit first inside the, the tube and then pass the fiber inside the conduit. And it can be done in a long, very distances. So it's a very, very interesting thing to, to be considered. Then uh, we need to locate where the connections will uh, will aggregate. And this is called a data center. Uh, it can be inside a, a municipality building or maybe uh, if they have one closed, we, we need to construct uh, a box uh, outdoor. And that's an example of one of that we did. Uh, it's a very small uh, stuff, so it can be very, very 
deploy it fastly and it has a very good result. So is the project viable? Then we need to prepare the documentation to start. We need to do a draft of the project, uh, of the deployment plan, and, and then follow the, the next steps. One of the most important things is the legal aspects. So if we are now sure that we can pass the fiber, let's see if the law is allowing us to do. And then we need to ask each uh, participant in between the or, or deployment if we can pass the fiber uh, over there. So first, we need to submit a deployment plan, uh, document uh, what, the, what, what is the design of the network, the administrative, uh, they have some time to answer. Uh, if they don't answer in, in a lot of months, then uh, the answer is yes. So, uh, we can go ahead. Uh, the project for municipality sometimes is repeated because there are technical uh, aspects that they want to know, of course. If they have infrastructure in, in the towns, uh, they need to know where are from where are passing and have all of them documented. So it's very important if the municipality requires uh, perform a, a project with all the technical aspects. Uh, also, as I say, the permissions can be from the municipalities, from the general administration, uh, maybe for larger infrastructure operators, the train or uh, highway uh, operators but also can be done by particular owners that can give us the permission to pass the, the fiber. Um, and also the, the permissions uh, related to the, to the Marco, to the process of ask uh, Movistar the, about the conducts, is performed uh, by fundaciogifi.net that it uh, managed this, this way. The network design that we show is a GPON typical implementation. Um, we need to design this uh, because there are limitations about the distance and number of these devices connected to them. Uh, also, we need to cover some areas that are very, very full and other ones that are very empty, like industrial areas. Uh, sometimes they, are, they have only few. So we need to plan that that arm of the network uh, from where it's coming and how many fibers we will have. Also, we need to calculate the, in the network design all the power loss that we have uh, in between the passive elements. Uh, the GPON deployment does not need uh, from power source in the elements that are in between. So it's uh, a very good advantage. Also, the uh, fiber cable uh, has a very low uh, loss, uh, and also the splices are very, very, uh, very low in the in the loss. Where we found the, the most of the of the loss is in the splitter. Is where uh, we separate the fiber in order to have uh, a lot of customers connected uh, when in one single fiber. As you see. The level of split is increasing a lot. The, the loss passive of the of the all the link. So we need to take it very 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 care about that. Also, for perform a network design, uh, it's very helpful to have uh, some some tools that can help us uh, to to make draws and to plan the, the, the cable, the poles, uh, each element in the network needs to be represented in, in the design. Because then uh, we can find some trouble, some problems, and we can separate them and make it easy, the, the solution. So it's a very important thing. In Gifi.net, we have FiberFi. That is an open source uh, network deployed by, by some of the IT guys inside. Uh, we are very proud of that tool because uh, now it has a new, a new interface and it's very, very easy to use. It has no requires uh, very high skills and, and it's a very good tool. Let's go with the cable deployment. 
Uh, that's the dirty job that I said. Uh, it needs to be done by very strong people uh, because uh, working on outdoors is very, very hard. Uh, we have the sun, we have the rain, we have the, the cold. So we need to, to plan this, this uh, with uh, my recommendation is to, to have a, a very close uh, employees not to use uh, super-rented ones because uh, then the cable is done not 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 fine. It's 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 bad done. So we prefer to to work with very close people, uh, also pay them well because we'll, this part will perdure during the time uh, maybe 40, maybe 50 years. So <laughs> uh, that's a very important thing. So we need to dimension the the fiber optic. How many fibers we need in the in the principal brand of the of the deployment, and how many fibers then we need to to split in the final final facilities. Let's go ahead with the with which system we will have uh, inside the boxes. There are two main uh, types, the pre-connectoring and the fuset cable. Uh, some of them have, uh, as you see, the, the cost of the material pre of the pre-connector is higher, but it avoids one fusion, so it saves time. Maybe uh, also it prevents the manipulation of the passive network because the box is always closed. So the technical the technician needs only to connect one side and also go inside the facilities of the customer and then do a splice inside uh, by the other way the fused cable uh, has a very low cost material uh, but it needs uh, two splices and requires the manipulation of the CDO so be care about that it's cheaper but uh, the preferred for me is reconnectory also, we need a lot of tools for do the cable deployment. Uh, you will need a, a very big uh, guider to pass through the longest conduct. Also, you will need a splicer that is not uh, cheap. It's uh, an expensive uh, tool. Uh, you will need some signalization stuff uh, and also other tools that maybe you will need or maybe not, depending on the area. Here sometimes it rains a lot and all the conducts are full of water. So first we need to go with the, with the water bomb and, uh, and keep dry the, the conducts. Also, you need to take care uh, about the loops. Uh, leave some, some cable uh, just for maintenance or just if you need to change the pole. Uh, have the possibility to do it, uh, not have a, a very short cable that it will not permit the work. Okay. The GPO and electronics uh, that we need to consider uh, about the dimension, about the capacity. Uh, the price are very, very, very uh, cute. All of them are, have a very good price now. So that's not a very expensive stuff. But maybe we need to uh, dimension about the consume of the, the device or maybe the, the number of end users that we will have in that zone. So the, it depends uh, on it if we will have one or another. And the final uh, step is to keep in mind the maintenance because the network will need it for sure over the time. Uh, optic fiber are very strong networks, very uh low incidence so and all of the incidents the 80 percent of the incidents are in the household so uh, keep in mind always have uh, very good uh, tools like the optical reflectometer that will keep as a complete vision of the path uh, including all the fusions all the connectors uh, that are in between so with that tool, we can see in a very fast way how to, where to go to repair that, that uh, problem. Uh, it's not a cheap one, so you will need to expand or maybe rent one to, to this is very important to have to consider it also. 
So thanks for giving me this ch this chance to explain you the fiber optic paradigm. And if you have questions, please ask. Any questions in the room for Chavi or online? Mm -hmm. uh, Carlos, did you get your questions answered about uh, the copper? I think yes. And there's a question for you, Chavi, um, from Machuki. Yeah. Uh, what vendors are you using for the GPN, ONT, and CPEs? Yes, uh, we are now using uh, Huawei, but we have also used uh, Telnet One, that is a Spanish brand, uh, at the beginning of the deployments. Now for uh, cost and, and because maybe everyone is going this way, we are using Huawei. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, Gpan, sorry about that. What's the, what's the question of the of the copper, sorry? Ah, yes, I see. Very similar OFM copper boxes. Yes, yes, in the, in the photograph, it, it looks very similar. Uh, at the end, the fiber optic cables uh, that we are using uh, are very similar to the copper ones. So expect the same, <laughs> the same density of cables, but by the way, the pre-connectoring increases a lot the space needed. So, uh, as you see, if uh, in, in one box we have less connections than in copper, so expect more space to have the same uh, connections. And there's a note in the chat that there are some um, questions and suggestions in open discussion in the GuifiNet community about the convenience of using Huawei products. Um, yeah, I am also very afraid about that uh, because there are recently rumors that uh, are not are not uh, are not good. Um, but well, we have some research and security teams that are looking for that, uh, working hard on on that. Um, also, we have some distributors that are responsible of uh, refilm the device. So, put a firmware that we know that is, is it's okay and it's original from the brand. And also, we check uh, after if the device are doing some bad things. Uh, we are scanning. We are doing a lot of research in that point. And for now, we can be uh, confident with that brand. Okay, thank you very much, Xavi. We appreciate your presentation. Um, we're gonna hop over to Leandro now, but continue in the chat on Jabber because there are some other questions that people are asking. Sure, I will. And for, yeah. and for folks in the room who don't know GuifiNet, it's probably the largest community network in the world, um, at least over what, Xavi, over 150,000 users, right? In different places. Yeah. Okay. And there's plenty of information online too at guifi.net. So Leandro, we're gonna queue up your slides, but you're up next. And I'll just ask the next three presenters. We have about uh, 30 minutes. So I'm gonna ask you to go pretty quickly if you can. And all your slides are uploaded. So it's just me creating the technical difficulty now and getting them up. So Leandro, you're up next. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope you hear me. Um, Okay, so the, the objective of the presentation is um, to talk about like um, one of the one of the activities we, we can do in, in Gaia, which is uh, about uh, proposing um, raising uh, information about uh, best current practices on, on different aspects. So some years ago we we had uh, an effort in, in Gaia to to document um, alternative ways um, other than the well-known to de develop connectivity um, and then um, so maybe next slide yeah um, so uh, it was RIC 7962 uh, that covers different technologies in different uh, cases so uh, things have changed uh, significantly in in some of the aspects of that document 
And then um, the discussion was if we can think about doing a, a document to, to report some of the best current practices beyond beyond the previous document. Next slide. So, um, yeah, the, the, uh, my, I started the idea of looking at uh, uh, particularly some um, developments we have changed, which have changed in the last uh, time, uh, which is connected to the previous presentation. Is uh, nowadays Fiverr has become more easy to deploy, and more uh, cost effective, and there are several examples of um, operators for, which are not. Uh, the typical commercial operators, but that can find that find and and and, um, and succeed in in delivering um, high speed broadband connections in communities that otherwise um, doesn't seem to be a uh, target of uh, commercial deployments. And then, uh, of course, the, every case is like complex and and particular, and the idea is to understand what are the mechanisms to do it, what are the environmental factors. To allow that to facilitate replication in especially in underserved areas or as alternative to other options and um next slide so um there are several cases um that um, that match this idea of uh, gigabit fiber networks and then and there are uh, as i said technology allows but the difficulty many times is about the huge investment required to do that um, that can be probably more easily done in a centralized by a centralized entity like an operator, but which which is difficult in cases where the operator is doesn't have a, an incentive to do it or is not interested because it's not profitable, but it's uh, socially profitable for the community to have it. Uh, there are, I mean, initial investments, uh, maintenance costs, the problem of uh, return of investment. And also the risk in in any long term investment, and um, and well, uh, in in the end, is this idea of uh, allowing uh, building your own connectivity, which has, has happened have appeared many times in the Gaia context. Next slide. So um, so with a few people started a, a survey to collect information about uh, some cases which deserve attention. As potential candidates to to this uh, best current practice on optical alternative networks, and then um, we we were starting to, to collect information about where, where they are, what is their finance financing and investment model, how they are organized legally, um, what what is their economic model, uh, the governance uh, things related to license stakeholders regulation in that particular place incentives which uh, enable or disable the development of these networks um, what are the differences and savings uh, compared to to a commercial model and also an important factor is seems to be the existence or not of uh, universal service fund uh, programs and how they are implemented and what effect they have in large that we know um, but also in small operators and and well this is the idea of the survey in the next slide you will see i think one one picture of uh, yeah of the live spreadsheet we are sharing to collect this information and then for instance we we collected details from one optical network that that runs in the uk it's called barn we also analyzed one optical network uh, among the several in the GIFINET ecosystem and, and, and one that is different from chavis uh, uh, one and one fiber network in the US in Vermont um, and so this is an ongoing process uh, so next slide so uh, the objective of this presentation is to collect ideas about how to how to how the idea make might make sense how to extract the document um, how to collect details and um, and see if this is a kind of reasonable, useful update over the previous RFC document that was produced in the working group. And I think that's uh, all. I think yeah, probably this. Uh, my email contact is at the end. So um, I'm looking forward to hear your comments or live or maybe by email about how we can develop that document. Thank you. 
Thank you, Leandro. And Leandro is the co-chair of Gaia with me, and what he's talking about is um, a great doc that we could hack together on um, best current practices. And a lot of the community networks are local access networks that are being built from the communities out, or the village, or the town, um, the region, are these small networks that, well, not so small if you're talking about Guifi, and now there's been a lot of publicity recently um, in the media about community networks because of the lack of access in a lot of rural, remote, and even urban areas. And so you've got the data there for um, Leandro, and we'll be um, bringing this back up on the Gaia list um, throughout the next months until we meet up back again in Montreal. So um, if you want to give uh, some information to Leandro, that would be excellent. And so any questions in the room? I don't see any. Uh, anything else in the Jabber chat, I think, Leandro, you can answer um, there. And we're going to hop over to uh, okay. Our colleague Julian Casas Buenas from Colnodo, which is um, affiliated with APC, a great project that does lots of great different work, but also specifically on community networks. And so we're going to bring up your presentation, Julian. Give us two seconds. Thank you. Ready. Thank you, Jane. Um, um, uh, thank you for the invitation. I would like to share with uh, all of you um, this experience that we developed in uh, Colombia, uh, in the southern part uh, of the country. It's called Buenos Aires, Cauca. No, um, and uh, um, basically what uh, we want to uh, uh, set up there, it's um, a cellular network and internet network as a social program uh, handled uh, by the community. Next, please. So what's our definition of a community network? Uh, it's uh, the, that connects rural communities at affordable cost. It's owned by the community and uh, it is in charge of uh, the community itself of its implementation operation and management. And the difference uh, between um, community network and a commercial uh, network, next please, could be um, uh, um, uh, represent here. Uh, the community owns the local network uh, while the commercial operator owns the network. The community uh, design builds and defines how the network will operate this is a uh, digital autonomy, while the commercial operator is the one who designs, builds, and defines the way in which uh, the network will operate. Um, the community network defines the fees uh, it will set for its affiliate, while the commercial operator is the one who defines the price that will charge. Um, community networks are uh, non for profit while the commercial operator seeks to obtain the greatest possibility utility. Revenues are applied uh, in the improvement of the network, innovation, training, and uh, remains uh, uh, owned by the community, while the revenues are applied to network maintenance and utilities for business owners. And um, community owns the operation along with uh, other communities that like uh, uh, be a part of uh, an association and the operator owns the operation of uh, leases and concession to other operators. So that's a uh, 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 comparison uh, between the, uh, the two models. Next, please. So what's the, uh, uh, what we are um, uh, offering uh, with these uh, initiatives? Uh, the cellular network uh, will provide unlimited calls within the network or community networks and unlimited local messages, SMS. And uh, we will handle the long distance and international calls uh, uh, through the voice over IP. So, um, uh, and also the network is uh, providing internet uh, connectivity. Uh, provide internet connection and um, internal network services. 
uh, we uh, set up an uh, um, internet network and we want to see how difficult it is in Colombia to interconnect the fiber optic that reaches most of the, um, um, of the, uh, most of, of the municipalities uh, and was um, deployed uh, during the past uh, government. And, uh, but it's still very expensive to connect these uh, fiber optics to the rural areas. But uh, that's the, in terms of uh, technical um, terms, is the, the best option that we have to reach uh, rural communities with the best uh, um, internet connection and uh, more stable. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's uh, still very expensive. Uh, please, next. Uh, so how uh, does it work, uh, this initiative? Um, each community is organized to install, operate, and administer its own uh, cell, uh, cell phone network and or internet. Uh, the, uh, an organization associates communities to strengthen the networks. Um, allied organizations provide technological legal, technical, and administrative advice. Uh, this is um, our partner in Mexico, Rizomatica. It's providing all the support for the uh, cellular network. The Association for Progressive Communication supports for uh, appropriation of technology with a gender focus. So we reach uh, uh, gender group, um, uh, women in, in the area of the project. Internet Society, uh, is providing uh, support as well, and University of Cauca and WorldCom. So it's very important uh, that uh, it's a, a branch of uh, organizations that are supporting the project uh, to um, different uh, um, aspects uh, of it. The um, community administers the, its network. Uh, they cover maintenance uh, fees and uh, receives uh, advice, training, and reports um, uh, for uh, testing the services and uh, for evolution and improvement of the network. Next, please. The technology we are using uh, for the mobile network uh, is based on uh, radio bases, uh, BTS and uh, control station uh, equipment. We are using Osmocom and OpenBSC, uh, which is a free software that emulates the component of the cellular network. And it's the one that uh, Rizomatica has been um, uh, developing. And um, it can handle up to uh, 14 to 28 simultaneous calls uh, for a perimeter of about five to eight kilometers. And it's intended to serve about 400 uh, to uh, 450 users. Um, next, please. This is the expected coverage that uh, we have uh, in the network. As I mentioned, is located in Buenos Aires, Cauca. It's like a, a south um, uh, west of uh, of the country. Next, please. And um, we have been supporting the uh, a community to get organized and administer the the system uh, through a community operator. And um, uh, each network has a, a person that uh, administer uh, it and one that supports the operation and maintenance. That's uh, the model that we want to implement. Next, please. Um, what we would like to prove with this pilot is demonstrate that with new technical, organizational and economic scheme, it is possible to provide cellular telephony service in a community and um, in a sustainable uh, way, and uh, that the community is able to contribute with the uh, uh, organizational structure, physical facilities, maintenance of the network, and also we are uh, providing legal support and technical support. So um, we would like to prove that um, uh, the community is uh, um, uh, uh, able to uh, run uh, their own networks. Next, please. Um, 
uh, it's important to mention that uh, we have been since the beginning and the signing of the project, uh, the participation of the community. Um, and um, they uh, also identify this kind of uses uh, for the network for protection of the community to alert in case of an emergencies, to convene and inform the community, to have a better uh, internal communications uh, within the community and uh, also to contact and communicate with uh, family contacts and other communities. Next, please. Uh, uh, also important to mention that the community has been very active in all the process of the installation, as you can see uh, in these uh, slides. Next, please. And um, uh, uh, well, we have a, this, this set up already. This is uh, part of the installation that uh, we did. And in some cases we are using solar panels to provide uh, power to the equipment. Next, please. And um, this uh, uh, resumes uh, the, what we have done so far. And um, um, the, we um, uh, did uh, the uh, in the first stage, the identification of the communities. We wanted to reach a community that uh, uh, it's isolated in uh, rural areas with uh, uh, very little connectivity. And um, uh, Buenos Aires, Cauca, it's uh, one of the zones where uh, ex-combatants of the guerrilla movement FARC that signed the peace agreement are located. So uh, it has been um, uh, a, a, an important uh, place to, to do this pilot. Uh, we did the planning uh, to, with the community, as mentioned. We did the installation already. And we are working with the uh, political and regulatory matters because uh, in Colombia, uh, we cannot use the um, uh, mobile um, spectrum uh, uh, that is required. So we are negotiating with the Ministry of ICTs and the Nation uh, 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 Agency of a Spectrum um, in in uh, in do this pilot to to prove that uh, this kind of projects can be implemented. And uh, we are uh, in the way to sign an agreement that will allow us to 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 use uh, the the spectrum and run the pilot and to prove their sustainability and um, uh, involvement of the community. Next, please. The, maybe mention also that we have been uh, negotiating for about two years now. And um, well, it has been difficult that uh, we expect that we will be able to, to, to have the permission to, to run the pilot uh, with the equipment for mobile communications. So, um, um, this um, uh, has been working also in the characterization of the communities and uh, uh, we run digital literacy workshops and uh, also um, uh, train them in marketing, educational resources, security and, uh, and networks. Next, please. Um, so, uh, maybe uh, 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 finalizing uh, uh, saying that um, uh, this has been um, a project with um, uh, uh, a permanent uh, uh, participation of the community and um, uh, we are um, uh, willing that uh, this uh, can be proved that uh, it's um, a model that can be uh, sustainable not only in financial terms but also in uh, uh, social terms. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Any questions in the room for Julian? This is an uh, amazing project. And as he was saying, the issues with Spectrum are difficult in many places. You've got the, the will and the energy and the technical equipment and the, the wherewithal. But then you can get hung up in using Spectrum that's actually available, <laughs> but you don't have the authorization mm -hmm. to use. Um, Yes, at, the, at this moment, um, uh, we are not allowed to, to use the, 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 the range of a spectrum that uh, we want to use. Uh, even if it's uh, free uh, at this moment, it's not used by any operator. And it's a very uh, tiny uh, uh, range of uh, a spectrum. 
but um, we are uh, discussing at this moment with the government uh, the implementation of a new law of ICTs uh, that a uh, new government want to 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 um, to present to the Congress, and we want uh, community networks to be recognized as an alternative for connectivity in rural areas where no um, uh, connectivity is available for them, but especially. Uh, to have access to the spectrum and deploy these kind of networks and initiatives. Thank you, Julian. I know how hard you've been working on this. And um, Colombia has a really good um, spectrum ministry and a great ministry of communication. So thank you for interfacing with them. I think what you're doing is actually leading the way for so many others. Um, if they're, um, I'm going to carve into your coffee break for about two or three minutes and, and give you a flavor for a project that will also have um, Nico Pache from Altermundi, who's also working now with APC. We're going to hop over to Nico for a minute. Um, I'm going to give you the access, Nico. And if you could take two or three minutes, and then we'll um, wrap up just because everybody here probably wants a coffee. But what we're going to do is um, also have Nico jump in first in the meeting in Montreal. So, Nico, we're going to pull up your slides. Thank you, Jane. And uh, hi to everyone. Thank you, Jane and Leandro, for facilitating the space. Uh, I am Nico Pache. I am part of uh, APC, the Association for Progressive Communications. Um, for those that have not heard about APC, you can put the next slide. Uh, APC is an international network dedicated to empowering uh, and supporting groups and individuals working for peace, human rights, development, and protection of the environment. We use ICTs, and we have been in in this uh, in this work in this space for about thirty years. Uh, APC has been doing uh, access projects for uh, has been involved in, in access and uh, connectivity in rural and in developing countries uh, for many years. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, last year. Uh, APC has run a project that was called Can Them Connect it, Connect Themselves. It was a project funded by IDRC that was run together with Rizomatica and in very close collaboration with Internet Society uh, that uh, looked to uh, research a little bit in, in regards to this, uh, this question. And uh, the outcomes of this research have been many uh, and they will be. Uh, announced uh, very soon at the WISIS forum uh, next month, um, and well, they have they have been uh, th there are reports in relation to the gender implications within community networks, the technical and and business models uh, that uh, the existing community networks are. Uh, using uh, and also uh, APC in collaboration with. Uh, uh, with ISOC, have released uh, some papers in relation to spectrum and uh, the typification of community networks in regulations and many other contributions along the way. Um, next slide. <coughs> so, with the output of uh, this uh, initial research project, um, the the it gave us information that was extremely valuable for us to continue to see what to do in uh, in, the, in the next steps. And uh, what the the research group discovered was that there were existing communities that would be very important to support. And by supporting the communities that were already running, uh, it would be a, a, an approach to grow the community network uh, world uh, as a whole. Uh, next slide. So the um, the project has identified identify five uh, areas in which we will be working to support community networks uh, in their process and so uh, grow the community network arena. Uh, the first one is about strengthening the community network movement. <clears throat> in order to do that, uh, 12 community networks from Latin America, Asia, and Africa will be supported to learn from each other. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, so they, they have been already identified, and I am glad to say that uh, Colnodo from Colombia, Colombia is one of the 
uh, communities that will be part of this uh, nine months uh, program. <clears throat> and the program will uh, focus on strengthening the capabilities of the existing community networks, uh, such as, uh, so it, it, all of those capabilities that are uh, weak, we will focus on helping them achieve uh, like to be more robust. And all of those strengths that they already have, we will support them in sharing those with their peers. Uh, that will happen through peer exchanges. So the community networks will be able to visit each other, to learn from each other. Uh, we will encourage them to produce materials that they can uh, uh, that they can use and many new communities can use to share knowledge uh, with each other. And also um, there's going to be a set of workshops in relation to technologies, methods and models. Uh, and probably, uh, well, not probably, part of it would be used to build a syllabus where that new community networks will be able to use to 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 build their own. Uh, the next part will be the awareness rising. No, please, previous one. Um, the awareness rising and movement building. Uh, so we don't only we we saw that part of the the growth of the movement it happens in this space uh, uh, where they got together. So we will support community networks in exchanging knowledge, not only with each other, but also in conferences. Um, so the, we will support them in participating at national and regional events and uh, leveling them up in a way, like uh, helping them be facilitators of spaces. Next slide. Um, then there is uh, the supportive innovative technology. And I think this is uh, very interesting for all of you. Uh, we have a set of Pathfinder grants, they are called. Uh, what they, the, the purpose of the Pathfinder grants is for the community networks to be able to innovate in uh, technologies or, in, in, or policy or regulation innovations that can help them uh, go one one leap forward a leap forward um, and uh, this will be bottom-up innovation so the, it, it will be by them and them being the center of the uh, of the technology innovation um, next slide uh, then there is a there's a, a part in relation to policy and regulation so in this context uh, regulation and policy as, as Julian shared with us, uh, it can be challenging and the uh, uh, frequencies might not be available for community networks or the legal framework might not be the most viable for communities to be able to thrive. So uh, there's going to be a lot of work in relation to make helping make the, the a legal framework that is viable for them in relation to doing training workshops with regulators, engaging in policy events, and also creating capacity within the communities to do to do so. Next slide. And the uh, and this last aspect that is the gender perspective is intersectional and it's uh, across all the activities that we will be doing. Uh, and it's about uh, having a gender perspective in relation to everything that we do and everything that we approach uh, so creating equal opportunities and for everyone within the community network movement next one so i will leave you with a link of the pro project where everything is going to be published along the way uh, and next one if you have any questions uh, about the presentations just uh, don't hesitate to send them thank you Thank you, Nico. And Nico was here a couple um, IETFs ago talking about Libra Mesh, Libra Router, which is open source mesh networking and servers. So he also can give you some great data on that type of work. But um, Nico, thank you. And I think any questions for Nico? It's a coffee break, Nico, so sorry. <laughs> People are headed out. No. But I, I will say this, that you're going to be up first in Montreal. And we'll be looking forward to hearing more about how the project is going. Um, APC is a huge partner of many of ours who are on this uh, 
and the presenters here today and a key partner for a lot of local connectivity and development. And if you haven't signed the blue sheets, please do that. But we'd like to thank everybody who participated today. Michuki, Miriam, Chavi, Leandro, Julian, and Nico, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you guys in Montreal and check us out on Gaia for the BCP that Leandro has started um, and we can all add to it. Thanks so much and appreciate your time and have a good day. So thank you to everybody, really great presentations. And keep up the good work to connect people who are unconnected. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, guys, we're gonna shut down the Jabber chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.